back. What have we got today? Well, it's one of those tone buddy things. You'll see it up there somewhere. Tone buddy. Tone buddy .co.uk. Talked about this on other videos with the gear that gets sent to me over a year. And uh, in this case, it's all about pedals. Well, it is for me. If I take a look at the pedal they just sent me. Oh my God, this is a monster. Reminds me of the wife. <laughs> oh my God. Let's get rid of this. Now then, what the hell have we got here? This looks absolutely evil. Yeah. It's because he is evil. Yeah. It's called an Origin Effects Revival Drive. And, uh, well, it might look entirely complex. Like me. Yeah. In fact, it's two separate pedals. So if you think of the orange ones as pedal one, and the silver ones as pedal two, you weren't really that far wrong. Now, doesn't that look much simpler when you see it like that? Or when you see it like that. Of course, when it's like this, it's a bit of a... can make your brain go dead. There's a load of stuff on this. A load of stuff. And uh, we're going to cover it. Well, first of all, as always, what we will do is take a look inside. Hmm. Yeah, just looking at it. It, uh, it says here it's got ghosting, overdrive, unabridged, amp tone. Tss unabridged yeah classic amp topology true double tone sag parallel path it's all there and it claims to be analog front to back analog it simulates uh, a preamp or preamps even uh from analog scarily and i mean scarily it's made in the uk made by origin effects in oxford that's what it says here. Tame Oxford. Good news is, I did check Origin Effects out, and uh, yeah, they're financially stable. So chances are, if you go and look for them in two years, five years, or ten years, or twenty years, chances are they'll still be there. Operated by a man named Simon. Yeah. Now, the company was founded in 2014, I believe, so it's five years old, at least, and from about 2016 onwards, it started to ramp up big time. So, they've been very successful at what they do, and you can see that. The fact of how many pedals they've sold all around the world, and who uses them, and things like that. But as you know, I'm not always so uh, entirely convinced of the people that claim to be using them actually got them for anything except free. That might not be the case here, but it's always better to have a look yourself, isn't it? And that's what this video is about. I'm just like you. I'm no wizard player. <laughs> you don't have to be. You can still buy one if you're not a wizard player. And that's the great thing about music and guitars. So let's, uh, let's go a bit closer. Have a look at the build quality first. And uh, yeah. Have a look at the controls second, then we'll get a bit of playing with it and listen to a few tones. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Now it's easy enough to whip the lid off, there's just four screws and away it comes. So let's go and have a look a bit closer, right? Well, here we are, inside the Origin Revival Drive. It actually comprises of two boards. I was to whip it around you'll be able to see that so it's a sort of uh, layered together uh, setup this top board's got really all the controls on it the bottom board is probably the one that does the business but I'm not going to pull it apart it's not actually my uh, my unit so we're here to take a look at the quality unfortunately I can't show you what's in there but all that's okay there's nothing stopping us having a look at the back here because the back's probably like the other side. It's all pretty much of a muchness. Just taking a look at this board. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what they use for the grading bit there. That's an interesting little comment. Grade Y11. 
QC past, I like to see that. And you'll notice down here, there's this little bit of white stuff, uh, which would actually stop me removing that board even if I wanted to, because that's like a sealer over a screw. And then you've got a few things at the end, which you could pull the board out then, but I can't do that because it's not my unit. Well, looking generally at this thing, again, uh, like most things you start seeing these days, it's surface mounted technology and uh, that's all great stuff. It's usually pretty reliable as well. You can see the quality in there and uh, I might throw up a few pictures. We can see close up uh, the, the sort of solder quality, but it's usually pretty good on machines. <laughs> they do a better job than humans generally. And even when you're sort of replacing this sort of thing, if, if you had to, uh, with the SMD equipment. Uh, yeah, it's not really that bad, providing you've got the equipment. But what do you do if you haven't? Well, you have a bit of a problem. And uh, equipment might include uh, like a heater for this board, for when you're changing a chip like that, or indeed any of these. Uh, they often have a heater and then they have a, an air blower that blows hot air onto this. So everything's kept at a nice temperature. You clean it off, put your flux on, and a uh, bit of solder, a bit of cleaning, da 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 da, and put a new one on. So it's not rocket science, but it's not easy for the ordinary person like me and you if you don't have the equipment. As it happens, I do have the equipment, but we don't use it that much. But there you go, there it is, that's what's inside. Quality is just really what you'd expect. And this is an English device, which uh, is a change for me. Uh, we don't see that many English devices these days, and that's a pity. Uh, some of the other ones I've seen, I won't name them, but uh, they're not up to the standard of this one. Simon, this, this fella Simon, uh, Keats I think his name, he's, uh, he's the designer and all the rest of it. He's done a really great job, from what I can see. But having said that, it looks pretty great inside as well. There's a load of, load of components in there. Anyway, it's a steel case as well, by the way. None of this aluminium crap. <laughs> it's a real, you know, it looks like stainless steel to me. Uh, so this case is going to keep this thing going for a long time and protect it very well. It's a load of adjustments, uh, they say, uh, when they make this. And what they do is sort of tune this pedal to their exact uh, exacting standards, I think that's what they say. So what you're getting is like a, a tuned uh, pedal uh, to their specifications, of course. You could change it, but I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, and, and, and you end up with a, a really, uh, well, it's almost like a custom product, isn't it? Yeah, looks pretty good to me. Particularly on the build. I mean, there's not much more you can say about the build. So I'm going to put the back back on it and then we're going to have a look around at some other settings and they are extensive, you have been warned. However, once you know about it, it's not as bad as you might think it is. Now then, taking a quick look at the back of the uh, pedal, the first thing you notice is this sticker. It gives you a few bits of uh, information about uh, a switch that's on the side and we'll have a look at that in a moment. But we've also got the uh, address, the name of the company, made in the UK, very nice. Don't throw it in your bin. The unit's been calibrated to our specifications, no user, no user serviceable parts inside. He's right, you can't do much with that. And it's CE approved, which uh, it highly likely is. <laughs> Some people don't do that, they just claim they do. But I think this one probably is. It complies with FCC regulations, so I guess it's a, a sort of available worldwide. Australia, Singapore, USA, Europe, everywhere really, I guess. Nice to see a steel case as well. Really, uh, really pretty cool, that is. Really protects the product, you know what I mean? On these three uh, switches at the side, just over the edge, that away, you'll see them when we look at the back, not for long. The first one's uh, either flat or preamp applied. That's the dry, dry and bypass dip. Power amp only, it says there. Uh, the middle one is for silicon ore valve for the rectifier dip on the orange channel. 
And this last one is a thing called uh, a ghosting dip. Now that's nothing to do with uh, ghosts, <laughs> nor as we know them. So we've got a 50 or 60 hertz one, GB or USA, and that's a main simulation. You see that? So they simulate a number of things like preamp tones and all sorts of different stuff. Uh, but we'll come to all that. It's all interesting later. Let's, uh, let's have a look at the back where we connect everything. Well, here we are around the back. There's not much to see at the back. You don't see any uh, markings on the back, but they're actually up here on the top. You can't see them from there, but you'll, you'll see them in a bit. But let's just mention them now. This one's where you plug your guitar or instrument, it says. You've got a foot switch connector here. Uh, we've got the mode switches that we just spoke about. We've got a 9 volts DC connector, and by the way, the center is ground, uh, the centers are negative. Let me put it that way around. 9 volts DC. And that one goes out to your amp. Simple and straightforward. Oh my god. Well, things have changed from the days of these, haven't they? Remember them? <laughs> That's for reviewing on another time. But uh, yeah, when you look at this, it looks really complex, but the fact is, if you think of it as being like that, a left and a right, that'll help you a lot, as it helped me in fact. It all looks very complex, but in reality, well, it's almost a walk in the park at night. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So what's this thing really all about? Well, it says that the, the revival drive, it's, a, it's like a dual channel overdrive pedal, and it recreates a wide range of classic non-master volume valve amp tones, you know, vintage stuff, including distinctive power amp sag and ghost tone effects. Well, yeah, well, we'll see about some of those, won't we? Uh, so I guess if you've got a, a, a JTN45, yeah, or a, maybe even a JCM800, or something like that, or a, a Plexi. Well, if you've got all them, you might not want one of these, but <laughs> most of us don't have all of those amps. Uh, we usually have a bit more modern amp, cheaper, more reliable, I guess, and uh, all the rest of it. So, so this pedal uh, could very easily or nicely uh, drive you down the route to a bit of the more vintage stuff uh, than what you might have used currently. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Well, it is to some people. Uh, you know, you've always got to remember some of those older tones uh, are classed as, well, they're liquid gold, aren't they? Anyway, basically, here it is, and under the hood, it contains a complete and unabridged valve amp style signal path, it says here, uh, with simulated preamp, notice it's simulated, phase inverter, power amp, and rectifier stages. So it's got all these stages. And there's a lot of stuff in there, like we saw. Uh, and it says here, it successfully recreates a sophisticated interaction of these different stages. And by imitating the complex relationship that exists between an amp and its mains power, the revival drive puts incredible tone shaping power at your disposal. Notice it's tone shaping. At the same time, revival drive incorporates a range of controls that will tailor its response to suit the amp you're plugging into. Unlike the vast majority of overdrive pedals, the revival drive is genuinely designed to sound fantastic with any amp. Well, it might well do, but so does this one. Don't want to be biased there, by the way. It's just a statement of fact. So does the TS9. Uh, they say it's the best sounding, most flexible overdrive pedal ever created. And I, you know what? With all this stuff on here, and some of these things we're going to look through, I can believe that. It probably is the most flexible overdrive pedal ever created. But is it the best sounding? Well, that's part of what this review is about. But it's also all about, you know, is this thing made to last? You know, what's the quality? What's the company behind it? What's all those other things that matter? And uh, we're going to cover most of that sort of stuff. In any case, if you want those old vintage tones, you'll know which ones I mean, if, if this pedal's even any use to you. Uh, you know, you don't have the amps, you can't crank them to the 100 watts that they would like to be running at, or you'd like them to be running at. And, uh, you know, it's completely non-feasible to go and buy those amps and crank them flat out. And if you stuff something on the output side, so you reduce the 
overall volume, it changes the tone. We all know that, or you should know that. This thing, they say, will do the simulation, or emulation, call it what you like. I've got a whole series about simulators and emulators, it seems, at the moment. Uh, and this thing will do it, they say. And I'm, I'm not saying it won't. Uh, we'll get to that when we plug it in. Uh, yeah. So, being able to go into great depths with some of these settings allows you to really tailor this pedal in a way that, I keep coming back to this one, in a way that this thing here never could be. And that's why the Revival Drive uh, is something to consider, especially if you're into those vintage tones. Part of the design of uh, coming along with this, by the way, was actually going and taking a listen to all those really vintage amps, the Plexis and the JTM 45s and the 800s and the rest of it, and uh, probably all of the American ones like, uh, you know, the Fender. And, those type of amps. You're not going to find, uh, uh, well I doubt you will, uh, you'll find a, a screaming monster in here from Mesa Boogie. Although, who knows, <laughs> we'll see. Now there are a number of features inside this little beast that they say are unique and uh, one of them's uh, basically dual class A preamp stages and it says with realistic amp gain staging Balance headroom and natural preamp style clipping. Well, sounds a good idea. As does all the other things in here, like phase inverter and push pull power amp stages. These provide realistic tonal response, symmetrical harmonics, subtle crossover distortion, and touch sensitive drive characteristics. All these things sound great, but what are they really like when we get to plug in? Well, that's another story. Variable negative feedback. In the output stage, let you boost presence or fine tune the dynamic response and clean to overdrive transitional characteristics. Why are you saying it use English, these guys? I don't know. It's got a reactive load. Reactive load models the interaction between a real valve output stage and a speaker cabinet, delivering amp like feel and realistic harmonics. And I must say that, generally speaking, in a lot of the uh, sort of simulated stuff that I've played through over the years, uh, it doesn't have the feel. And this company is saying that they've actually uh, got beyond that. So that should be interesting. There's also a solid state silicon and valve rectifier channels. They're in there. Plus a simulated mains power supply to generate realistic sag characteristics and ghost tones. Well, if you've got a Road King 2, you'll know what sag is and solid state is and those sort of things. But on the older amps, they... they Basically, you'd, you'd lose some of the voltage when the amp's trying to get more out of the uh, transformers and power circuit than it's capable of producing, and it's affected the tone. That's the simplest way I'd describe it. Now, in the handbook, uh, it covers a huge amount of things, such as things like bright caps. What else have we got in here? We got. It, it explains why they matter. Bright caps, bright cap compensation, low frequency distortion, negative feedback, what it is and what it's all about. I could go on all day about it. Uh, ghost tones, interesting, we'll probably talk about that. Sag valve versus silicon rectifiers. We've got rectifier, sag and ghost tones again. On it goes. Now, I'm not going to hop on about most of the other stuff. I mean, it's all about how this thing sounds, but I do want to get across to you what some of these things are. And I just wanted to cover the aspect about ghost tones because I haven't seen that on any other pedal anywhere and uh, whether whether that's covered somewhere else, who knows? It's, it's not uh, something I've seen anyway. So these ghost tones, some people call them ghost notes or ghosting or double tones and this sort of thing, it describes uh, it says here, the phenomenon of low frequency notes occurring within the amp. Underneath those, you're actually fretting. Play through a fully cranked, hot biased, black faced twin reverb, if you can afford one, or any early 50 watt Marshall Plexi, and you will experience otherworldly unique low tones, particularly when soloing further up the neck. Well, you might. Yeah. I always used to hear the wolf tones, the Hendrix wolf tones, that. Uh, yeah, particularly when he was cranked. 
Uh, those are the sort of tones I like myself, but uh, you know, that's what this is about anyway, uh, ghost tones and not wolf tones. These dissonant ghost notes appear to be completely unconnected to the true note, but in fact they relate to the sum of differences between the frequency of the power supply and the frequency of the notes being played, hence that 50-60 hertz thing on the back. Ghost tones are certainly undesirable when they become loud and prominent, usually indicative of faulty power supply filtering, but at low levels they create a distinct vibe. Well, you know what? It's all technical stuff. What really matters about this thing is how it sounds. It says, we designed this control to offer a broad range of adjustment while never reaching the extremes where ghost tones become undesirable. And it hops on about looking at uh, 68 Marshall Plexis, early 60s Fender brown face amps, several mid 60s Fender black face amps, and various others. We found that our 1964 Vox AC30, as well as our 1967 Fender Twin, offered the most pronounced ghosting. We then tweaked the ghost control to go 30% further. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway, uh, the revival drive simulating mains power supply can be switched between US and UK mains frequencies, 50 and 60 hertz. Uh, and that is like 100 or 120 hertz once rectified. We're using that mode dip switch at the back, you know, the one we looked at earlier. Uh, changing the power supply frequency alters the pitch of the ghost tones as well. So, so yeah, 50 and 60 hertz, that's what it's all about. Very interesting. But there is one little bit of thing I do need to talk about, and it relates to rectifier sag and ghost tones. You know, those ghost tones that, that are in this that aren't anywhere else. Well, except in real amps. And it says here, because both sag and ghosting are generated in the power stage of the amp, there's a degree of overlap and interaction between these two effects. As you would expect, this is fully reflected in the revival drive. That's what they did. Firstly, the choice of rectifier channel influences the sound of the ghost tones produced. This is because the wave shape of the rectified power signal is slightly different for each of them. Something close to a smooth triangle wave in the case. I mean, he's going on and on in this manual about how they do it. But what I wanted to uh, cover was that it does an interaction, really. It also has, by the way, something I never talked about. It does actually have a, uh, an extra external foot pedal that you can buy, I'm sure. And off you go with that. So let's start looking at this a bit closer. We've got an on or off. And we've got this thing here, this switch, that allows you to switch from this one to this one. You can see it there. Looking at the colours, if it's valve rectification, you can see it says it at the top there, just about. And that's silicon rectification. So think of sort of two pedals like that. Valve, silicon. Got a little indicator in the middle, just shows you when the thing's turned on. Yeah, that sounds like an idea. Ah. Now one thing I do want to mention <coughs> is this, that the, the valve rectifier side can be flipped across to be a second silicone rectifier drive. You use it by getting at the mode switch at the back. So this side can be one of them sides, if you get me. That side can't be one of them sides though. Ah. So. You can turn this into a silver one. Yeah. Let's have a look at the uh, controls across the uh, unit. Volume, pretty obvious what that does. Uh, yeah, it's the volume. It could be a gain control. You'd see it as that. Uh, I'd see it as a gain control rather than volume. Sounds a bit weird, but there you go. We, next one we got is a lows. The lows having to set the desired treble response using the preamp switch. The lows control allows you to adjust the amount of bass pushing the drive circuitry. Pretty obvious. <laughs> it says here, box-like. Well, it might be. Uh, more presence. This control combines two parameters, but both related to the effects of negative feedback in the power amp. Yeah, there it is. Presence, turn it clockwise. You know what a presence is, don't you? Sort of treble sort of thing. And uh, yeah, more, the more bit, turn it counterclockwise, the more control reduces negative feedback in the pedal. 
in its push-pull stage. So, more or less, <laughs> I guess you could say that. At 12 o'clock, there's a definite threshold to this transition with an abrupt switch from clean to overdriven once you pick it hard. So that's a useful uh, angle. Next we got the uh, the output uh, control. You set this really for the overall output level of the channel. Adjust the volume, this one, and the output control to achieve the desired combination of distortion and level. Pretty much what you'd expect it to be really. We got a blend. Uh, now the blend uh, control lets you adjust the mix between the dry input and the overdriven signal created by the uh, revival driver overdrive. From 100% uh, when the controls clockwise, you can mix it with your signal if you turn it backwards, that's minimal. Now we've got the ghost, see it there? Yeah. It lets you introduce those ghost tones uh, by varying the amount of the capacitance in the pedal's amp style power supply. Yeah, well, you play around with it. That's what I'd say. I'm not going to sit here reading what everything they say. That doesn't add up. Now, moving along a bit further, we've got this little preamp switch, if you can see it just there. Yeah, preamp switch. That offers you three snapshots of classic amp tone shaping. All right, so the first one in the center position with that little zero there. Okay, there's the preamp switch. And uh, it's got three positions, as you can see, in the centre position there. That's based on the classic British tone shape, almost flat with a subtle treble lift. Yeah, classic British tone shape. Well, I always think of Marshall, but it could be a number of them, couldn't it? Uh, and then we've got this one on the left here, the GB. Uh, this is modelled after a configuration wildly used by those cranking early Plexi Marshalls. Oh, maybe that's not Marshall. <laughs> Fancy that. Uh, treble and mid-tone control set for with the bass set very low. This equates to a tone rich in mids with a tight mush free bass. Well it does on a one of them, one of them amps. Uh, it might well on this. Well, let's have a look at the other side. The US. So the GB US and everything in between I guess. Uh, this applies to the same mush free approach to cranking but to a black face fender amp for a glassier brighter tone. So tiny little switch but It'll have pretty much of a big effect. Now we move along to the bright cap switch. All these matter, by the way. Bright cap switch. This is uh, connects a capacitor to the volume. There it is. Uh, this allows higher frequencies to sidestep any attenuation in exactly the same way as the bright switch found on many black face amps, silver face, and Fender. This allows high frequencies to sidestep uh, any attenuation in, in exactly the same way as the bright switch found on black face and silver face fender amps. So, yeah. When you flip it to the US one over here, uh, high frequencies get more, see more maximum gain while the low and mid frequencies remain clean or overdriven, depending on where the user sets the volume. It's coming back to this volume all the time, isn't it? And uh, the GB one over here, uh, this effect is far more pronounced with both mid-range and high frequencies allowed to bypass the volume control. Consequently, the volume control becomes very non-linear in operation and behaves more like a high gain tone control. Now you've also got a, a thing here called mid-assign, just right there. Now the mid-assign, uh, that's like a, a, a mid-range boost. Uh, it's a three-way switch if you look carefully and, and it applies to the mid boost to either the valve rectifier channel with the switch left uh, or the silicon with the switch right with the switch in the foot switch position which is where it is at the moment uh, the mid boost is deactivated but can be switched in at any time using the optional foot switch well I haven't got this foot switch so it'll be on this one or that one or we'll turn it off and see what the sound's affected with it You've also got on the same control a mid-level and a mid-frequency. The mid-level sets the level of the mid-boost from plus 2 to plus 8.5 dB. Yeah, so that's a boost. And the mid-frequency sets the center frequency of the mid-boost from 800 Hz to 2 kHz. So, useful piece of stuff if you're into getting your mids boosted. 
which is the way that the old style guitarists used to play, didn't they? Bang the mids up. Now we've got another uh, little thing here called a dry gain control. This is just the level of the dry signal. It's that's mixed with the OD signal using each channel's blend control. Yeah, there it is. We've got a blend control. There. Right there. Now we've got a little, little ditty over here. Uh, the Reamp PQ controls. It's comprises of this one and these two here. You can see it. It's sort of got a line around it. Yeah. It's one way of doing things, I guess. But this Reamp PQ, this ensures compatibility with a, a wide range of amps, really. And instead of altering your amp tone controls to suit the revival drive, set your amp for what the desired clean sound is that you'd like. And then use the Reamp EQ controls to adjust the revival drive's output to suit your amp. So this is almost like a, an amp matcher, <laughs> for want of a better phrase. Uh, we've got a switch here, and on the left it says power amp. Uh, you use this setting when plugging into a flat, re flat response power amp, you know. The EQ is set more or less flat with a subtle bass boost. Now you've got EQ1 in the middle. That's designed to suit the response of a black face fender amp. EQ1 applies a low pass filter roll off, roll off excessive highs, so no, it could be. Uh, and EQ2 over this side. Uh, it's voiced for a Marshall amp with the channels bridged, you know, with the piece of wire. I've got a, a JTM45 that will be pushing this through when we go and do the uh, the playing demo, which should be quite interesting. It's a decent amp, isn't it? Uh, anyway, voiced to a Marshall amp with channels bridged, EQ2 sits between the other two filter shapes, applying a high shelf cut to gently rein in high frequencies. I'm telling you now, the JTM45 can give a half can have very, very high frequencies. Make no mistake of that. Now let's move on to these two. Uh, this one's called High Shelf. High Shelf is a, a treble boost or cut control. Uh, make small adjustments, really, uh, to the high frequencies. Yeah. Useful if you were using a fender amp. And the, the bright cap uh, cut, uh, that's a a low pass high cut filter again designed to compensate for the tonal effects of the bright cap uh, wired to the host amplifier volume control which some, sometimes they're on there and sometimes they're not. Uh, we, it can lead to a very bright and harsh sound when fed with an overdrive pedal so you can rein it in a little bit with all this stuff. Uh, yeah, what more can you say? But useful if you're using Fender amps for example. Now there is another pedal uh, called a, a Revival Custom Only, a Revival Drive Custom. And that's got uh, settings down the bottom on the front where this one was blank. I'm not going to cover it, but they are available. Now we did actually cover the little switches that are down the back, down here. I'm not really going to harp on about them too much. Uh, one's a dry bypass dip switch. Uh, it's only relevant when you reamp switch is set to the power amp position. I won't bore you with it. Number two is a rectifier dip switch. Move switch two to the up position to transform the valve rectifier channel into a second silicon channel, which is what we've mentioned earlier. And number three is the ghosting dip switch. Switch three toggles between 50 hertz and 60 hertz, uh, which simulated main frequencies, subtly altering the pitch of the ghost tones, which is what we said earlier. And, and there's also a foot switch uh, connector on the back uh, for the optional pedal that I did also talk about but that will give you another couple of extra features of this pedal and uh, yeah it might, it might be useful for you because you can have uh, for example if you connect the optional dual button switch uh, you can have a mid engage with the pedals mid assign switch set to foot switch this allows you to apply the adjustable mid boost to whichever channel is currently selected so you can whack a mid boost in and the other thing uh, is uh, you, you've got a thing called a blend override on the foot switch. Uh, and it can override or remove each channel's blend control from the signal path with the blend knob set for mix of dry and OD signals. Engaging the blend overdrive removes the dry component and reverts to 100% overdrive signal. Uh, that's like, uh, you know, getting more flexibility 
like having another channel on your amp. So it's almost like a boost or a cut, depending on how you look at it. Now that really covers uh, most of everything that's on here. Uh, what more can I say? A lot to look at, but actually when you break it all down, it's not as bad as what you think. Or well, hopefully it isn't as bad as what you did think. Uh, personally, I think once you get this set up right, it can be a really great addition. Uh, for your amps and things like that, especially if you're after those old vintage tones, you know, uh, cranked vintage tones I might add. I don't want the clean ones. I get most amps sound like a clean old amp. Yeah, they just sound like a clean old amp, don't they? <laughs> anyway, let's go back up top. Well, there you go. Hopefully, as you've heard and seen, this is a, a pretty powerful pedal. And I think that, like I said before, you know, for those vintage tones, it's probably going to do a pretty good job from a clean amp. Just a straightforward clean amp. You can get a lot of, uh, a lot of drive out of it if you set it up in the right way. And depending on your amp, you know, you don't want to go fiddling around with your amp uh, every time you want to use this, do you? So, those particular controls down there allow you to sort of tailor the uh, pedal to what your amp is generally set to. And I, I think that's a good idea because Failing that, you're going to be little lines all over your, you remember them, don't you? <laughs> all over your amp as to where they should be set. Uh, JTM 45 and Plexis have got them usually. <laughs> it's not for me, no. I like to leave the amp in one position and get it set up right because they're single channel amps, aren't they? And uh, away you go. Uh, so, yeah, interesting pedal. Like I said, this one came from Tone Buddy, Tone Buddy Co. UK. You'll see it sort of up there somewhere. I'll put the little logo up and things like that. Which is uh, it's sort of driven by sound effects from Ormskirk in, uh, in the UK. I'd say Manchester, but it's not quite Manchester, I don't think. I think it's nearer Liverpool than Manchester. Anyway, them Scousers, you know what they like, but in this case, actually, sound effects is a pretty good company. So if you're into uh, pedals, that uh, tone buddy thing is a good idea because you can try them and try them and try them. And you can do it for a month or three months or whatever you want. I did it for a year because I don't want to keep buying pedals, as I've explained on many occasions. Uh, I usually buy everything. Well, this is like buying it because I don't have any bias for or against on any of the pedals, which is a, a good thing. Well, where do we go from here with it? What's the score? What, how would I rate it? Well, I have had it plugged in. I usually do before I do these things. And uh, Yeah, you can't really give it a score if you don't do that, can you? So, well, I've got a JTM45, like I said. And the JTM45 is what this will be used with. I haven't got a Fender. I, have, I haven't got the other stuff. So... So I've got what I've got, and it'll be junked and, and all the stuff. And I thought it sounded pretty good. Uh, is this pedal for me? Well, it's not actually for me, no, because I'm one of these guys that doesn't really use pedals much. I can afford to crank it up. And, you know, a JTM 45 is about... Uh, just about livable when it's flat out. Yeah, just. <laughs> and I think they're only like uh, 30 watts or something. Or 18 watts, some of them. I don't know, it's a number of models and that sort of stuff. But thing is, I can plug this into it and have it on its nice clean channel where it resides for most of the time. And it'll change it into the monster that it should be. <laughs> and that's the idea of it. But I like the tweaking as well. So as far as the score goes, uh, it's really well made. That matters. The company's growing. That matters. Uh, yeah, I'd give it about an 8. About an 8. They're not a cheap device in, in England here. It's about £400. That's an equivalent to probably $520 or maybe more. But that does include the tax, which is 20% in England, remember. So in the USA, well, you'll be getting a veritable bargain. That is if they keep the price the same as it is here. You've got less tax. Well made. Decent product, made in England, made in Ingoland, as they say, yeah, and uh, recommended really, if you are into vintage amp tones. Oh, you're not, 
Oh, you're a, you're a boogie guy. You could use it, well, I would, you know, if you're a metal guy or a rock, you know, modern rock guy, is it for you? Well, it could be. Thing is, if you're in the tone body thing, you can try it. And that's the advantage, uh, like it is for me. It would be an advantage to you. So, very little else to say about it. Yeah. Now the plane's coming up. There's sort of six or seven settings in the back of this uh, manual over here. Uh, and I might use some of them. I might use their settings to show you what is achievable that they say it should sound like. Obviously, you'll tune it to the amp, but apart from that, yeah. So we've got lots of reviews coming up. Uh, as I was talking on, uh, on, the, cha on the YouTube channel, uh, there's a lot of things coming up relating to simulated amps. And that can cover a multitude of things. Indeed, it even covers this one. This is probably the first one in the series of the simulated amps because it does say it's simulated uh, with transistors. Hmm. But some of the others are simulated with software, aren't they? And we've got some of that coming up. And some of them include effects, and some of them are this, and some of them are that. The Tech 21s, for example, they're coming up. They're simulated amps, aren't they? And they've got a few effects in them. For the money, they're pretty cool, that one, I think. But uh, you'll get to see about them. And indeed, my old Ibanez pedal picked this one up recently. Right price, so to speak. So they can be expensive, can't they? These, these simulated amp reviews that are coming up, some of them are going to be very controversial. I'm pretty sure of that. Because, you know, often uh, guitarists, they fall into one or two camps. Oh, them are great, or them are not great. The simulated ones are as good or better than the tube amps. Well, the tube amp guys will tell you, oh no, the tube amps are much better than the simulated ones. They're not the same. It's, you know, there's a difference. Well, there is a difference. Uh, well, that difference is narrowly, very, very, very slowly. Uh, one of the next reviews I'll be doing uh, is a H&K uh, Black something or other. I forgot its name even. <laughs> anyway, you'll know about it. Uh, that's coming up. And uh, we're going to have a look inside that one, I think. Yeah, yeah, nobody's done that. Part of the route where we go down these simulated products, the Tech 21s or this one, I'm not even going to name them because <laughs> let's have it as a surprise. So, don't forget to go to www.tonymackenzie.com where there are a lot of reviews. I haven't updated it in a while. I keep saying I will, but I haven't. And don't forget Tone Buddy. Yeah, up there, you'll see it. Tonebuddy.co.uk. Or uh, sound effects themselves. They've got some uh, brilliant guitars and stuff like that. Um, that's why I keep going back to sound effects. Good stuff. And uh, Andy in there, he, he offers a good service as well. I don't know about the other guys. I've, I've met him, but uh, I always usually go back to Andy because I know him. Uh, but apart from that, well, there's sound effects. Da -da 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 da uh, so let's go and move on to the playing of this. I'm looking forward to uh, getting this on camera. I don't know how well it'll sound or how well it'll come out or any of that stuff. Well, that doesn't really matter. I'm plugging it in just like you will. And uh, it'll probably sound good to me whether it comes out good on the, uh, the video or not. I don't know. So, yeah. So until next time, uh, that's a quick, well, it's not so quick. It's an overview of the Revival Drive from Origin Effects, made by, what's his name, Simon Keats. Yeah, he's one of the good guys. You look inside that thing, oh my God, clever guy. And uh, yeah, all looks good. Now get out of here. Here I am with the Origin uh, Revival Drive, and I'll take you through uh, a few of the uh, settings that they recommend and I'm using this amp today which is a, it's a JTM45 puts out about 30 watts or so and it can be loud but I'm keeping it pretty reasonable and all the settings are set to 12 o'clock so let's go from there eh? Here we go. This first one by the way is Tumbling Dice. It's on the, it's in the manual. Yeah. 
the Strat here, well Strat style, <laughs> with the uh, Zex coil pickups, which are sort of clever. Go and check the review for this. champions that's a setting within the manual and uh, yeah it's got a bit of drive to it this one and uh, the amp's only just turned on you know, by the way I think it's on about number two <laughs> it could be higher but uh, let's not worry about that okay there's some examples of the tones sounds pretty cool here but uh, I don't know what it'll be like in the mic <laughs>
Now that about uh, sums up the uh, Revival Drive Origin with some just basic chords and things like that. So I'll play a bit of a track, I guess, and uh, I guess it's designed for that sort of tone. Or well, maybe not. <laughs> Anything will do, won't it? No, maybe not, it won't. But, uh, or maybe it won't, <laughs> even. Uh, but yeah, great sounding pedal. It sounds just like, in, when you're in here, it sounds exactly like a plexi. Uh, because it's going through a sort of plexi, but sort of a bit before. It's sort of a uh, bit toppy, I guess. But plexis are really great pedal. Yeah. So uh, I think they did a, a great job of it. And uh, to sum up, uh, if you like that sort of tone, you know, that sort of old-fashioned... Yeah, that's what you want, one of them. Uh, Origin Effects Revival Drive. You can get it from Tone Buddy, or rent it from Tone Buddy. That sounds like a plan. Anyway, here we go. Till next time.